Welcome back guys to Van's Reading. We're on chapter 30, Rare Events, Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman. So let's begin the chapter 30, Rare Events. I visited, I visited Israel several times during a weird, uh, during a period in which suicide bombings in, in buses were relatively common, though of course quite rare in an absolute terms. There were altogether 23 bombings between December 2001 and September 2004, which had caused a total of 236 fatalities. The number of daily bus riders in Israel was approximately 1.3 million at that time. For any traveler, that, for any traveler, the risks were tiny, but that was not how the public felt about it. People avoided buses as much as they could, and many travelers spent their time on the bus anxiously scanning their neighbors for packages of bulky clothes that might hide a bomb. I did not have much occasion to travel on buses as I was driving a rented car, but I was chagrined to discover that my behavior was also affected. I found that I did not like to stop next to a bus at a red light and I drove away more quickly than usual when the lights changed. I was ashamed of myself because of course I knew better. I knew that the risk was truly negligible and that any effect at all on my actions would assign an inordinately high decision weight to minuscule probability. In fact, I was more likely to be injured in a driving accident than by stopping by stopping near a bus. But my avoidance of buses was not motivated by a rational concern for survival. What drove me was the experience of the moment being next to a bus made me think of bombs, and these thoughts were unpleasant. I was avoiding buses because I wanted to think of something else. My experience illustrates how terrorism works and why it is so effective. It induces an availability cascade an extremely vivid image of death and damage. Constantly reinforced by media attention and frequent conversations becomes highly accessible, especially if it is associated with specific situations, such as the sight of a bus, the emotional arousal is associated automatic and uncontrolled, and it produces an impulse for protective action. System two may know that the probability is low, but this is knowledge, uh, but this knowledge does not eliminate the self-generated discomfort and the wish to avoid it. System 1 cannot be turned off. The emotion is not only disproportionate to the probability, it is also insensitive to the exact level of probability. Suppose that, the, uh, that two cities have been warned about the presence of suicide bomb bombers. Residents of one city are told that two bombers are ready to strike. Residents of another city are told of a single bomber. Their risk is lower by half, but do they feel much safer? Many stores in New York City sell lottery tickets and business is good. The psychology of high-priced lotteries is similar to the psychology of terrorism. The thrilling, the thrilling possibility of winning the big prize is shared by the community and reinforced by conversations at work at home. And at home, buying a ticket is immediately rewarded by pleasant fantasies. Just as avoiding a bus was immediately rewarded by relief from fear. In both cases, the actual probability is inconsequential, only possibility matters. The original formulation of prospect theory included the argument that highly unlikely events are either ignored or overweighted. But it did not specify the conditions under which one or the other will occur, nor did it propose a psychological interpretation of it. My current view of decision weights has been strongly influenced by recent research on the role of emotions and vividness in decision making. Overweighting of unlikely outcomes is rooted in system one features that are familiar, familiar by now. Emotion and vividness influence fluency, availability, and judgment of probability, and thus account for the excessive response to the few rare events that we do not ignore. Overestimation and overweighting, what is your judgment of the probability that the next president of the United States will be a third party candidate? How much will you pay for a bet in which you receive $1,000 if the next president of the United States is a third party candidate and no money otherwise? The two questions are different, but obviously related. The first asks you to access the probability of an unlikely event. The second invites you to put a decision weight on the same event by placing a bet on it. How do people make the judgments and how do they assign decision weights? We start from two simple answers, then qualify them. Here are the oversimplified answers. People overestimate the probabilities of unlikely events. People overweight unlikely events in their decisions. Although overestimation and overweighting are distinct phenomena, the same psychological mechanisms are involved in both focused attention, confirmation bias, and cognitive ease. Specific descriptions trigger the associative machinery of system one. When you thought about the unlikely victory of a third party candidate, your associative system or associated, or so, I mean, I say, so, so, blah, 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 blah. 
Uh, your, so when you thought about the unlikely victory of a third party candidate, your associative, uh, associative system worked in its usual com confirmatory mode, selectively retrieving evidence, instances and images that would make the statement true. The process was biased. But it was not an exercise in fantasy. You looked for a plausible scenario that confirms to the constraints of reality. You did not simply imagine the fairy of the West installing a third party president. Your judgment of probability was ultimately determined by the cognitive ease of fluency or cognitive ease or fluency with which his plausible scenario came to mind. You do not always focus on the event you are asked to estimate. If the target event is very likely, you focus on its alternative. Consider this example. What is the probability that a baby born in your local hospital will be released within three days? If I can hide, I guess. You were asked to estimate the probability of the baby going home, but you almost certainly focused on the events that might cause a baby not to be released within the normal period. Our mind has a useful capability to focus sp spontaneously on whatever is odd, different or unusual. You quickly realize that it is normal for babies in the United States. Not all countries have the same standards to be released within two or three days of birth, so your attention turned to the abnormal alternative. The unlikely event became focal. The availability heuristic is likely to be evoked. Your judgment was probably determined by the number of scenarios of medical problems you produced and by the ease with which they came to mind. Because you were in confirmatory mode, there is a good chance that your estimate of the frequency of the problem was too high. The probability of a rare event is most likely to be overestimated when the alternative is not fully specified. My favorite example comes from the comes from a study that the psychologist Craig Fox conducted while he was Amos student. Fox recruited fans of professional basketball and elicited several judgments and decisions concerning the winner of the NBA playoffs. In particular, you asked him to estimate the probability that each of the eight participating teams would win the playoff. The victory of each team in turn was the focal, effect, the focal event. You can surely guess what happened, but the magnitude of the effect that Fox observed may surprise you. Imagine a fan who has been asked to estimate the chances that the Chicago Bulls will win the tournament. The focal event is well defined, but its alternative one of the other seven teams winning is diffuse and less evocative. The fan's memory and imagination operating in confirmatory mode are trying to construct a victory for the Bulls. When the same person is next asked to assess the chances of the Lakers, the same selective activation will work in favor of that team. The eight, the eight, the eight best professional basketball teams in the United States are all very good and it is possible to imagine even a relatively weak team among them emerging as champion. The result of probability judgment generated successfully for the eight teams has added up to 240%. This pattern is absurd, of course, because the sum of the chances of the eight events must add up to 100%. The absurdity disappeared when the same judges were asked whether the winner would be from the Eastern of the Western Conference. The focal event and its alternative were equally specific in the question and the judgments of their probabilities added up to 100%. To assess decision weights, Fox also invited the basketball fans to bet on the tournament result. They assigned a cash equivalent to each bet, a cash amount that was just as attractive as placing the bet. Winning the bet would earn a pay of $160. The sum of the cash equivalent for the eight individual teams was $287. An average participant who took all eight bets would be guaranteed a loss of $127. <clears throat> the participants surely knew that there were eight teams in the tournament and that the average payoff for betting on all of them could not exceed $160, but they overweighted nonetheless. The fans not only overestimate the probability of the events they focused on, they were over was so much too willing to bet on them. They were finding shed new light on the planning fallacy and other manifestations of optimism. The successful execution of plan is specific and easy to imagine when one tries to forecast the outcomes of a project. In contrast, the alternative of a failure is diffuse. Because there are innumerable ways for things to go wrong, entrepreneurs and the investors who evaluate their prospects are prone both to the overestimate their chances and to overweight their estimates. Vivid outcomes. As we have seen, prospect theory differs from the utility theory in the relationship it suggests between probability and decision weight. In utility theory, decision weights and probabilities are the same. The decision weight of a sure thing is 100 and the weight that corresponds to a 90% chance is exactly 90, which is nine times more than the decision weight for a 10% chance. In prospect theory, variations of probability have less effect on decision weights. An experiment that I mentioned earlier found that the decision weight for 90% chance was 71.2 and the decision weight 
for a 10% chance was 18.6. The ratio of the probabilities was 9.0, but the ratio of the decision weight was only 3.83, indicating insufficient sensitivity to probability in that range. In both theories, the decision weights depends only on probability, not on the outcome. Both theories predict that the decision weight for a 90% chance is the same for winning $100, receiving a dozen roses, or getting an electric shot. The theoretical prediction turns out to be wrong. Just want to make it clear that uh, what they're trying to say is that the probability of uh, when you see a probability, it probably affects your decision making and affects your emotional uh, uh, your emotional uh, action towards that probability, and therefore you have a lower intention of doing it. So, uh, psychologists at the University of Chicago published an article with an attractive title: "Money Kisses and Electric Shocks." On the effect of psychology of risk, their finding was that valuation of gambles was much less sensitive to probability when the fictitious, fictitious outcomes were emotional, meeting and kissing your favorite movie star or getting a painful but not dangerous electric book, than when the outcomes were gains or losses of cash. This was not an isolated finding. Other researchers had found, using physiological measures such as heart rate, that the fear of an impending electric shock was essentially uncorrelated with the probability of receiving the shock. The mere possibility of shock triggered the full-blown fear response. The Chicago, the Chicago team proposed that effect-laden effect imagery overwhelmed the response to probability. Ten years later, a team of psychologists at Princeton challenged that conclusion. The Princeton team argued that the low sensitivity to probability that had been observed for emotional outcomes is normal. Gambles on money and uh, gambles on money are the exception. The sensitivity to probability is relatively high for these gambles because they have a definite expected value. What amount of cash is as attractive as each of these gambles? 84% chance to win $59 or 84% or chance to receive one dozen red roses in a glass vase. What do you notice? The salient difference is that question A is much easier than question B. You did not start to compute the expected value of the bet, but you probably knew quickly that it's not far from $50. In fact, it is $49,56. And the vague estimate was sufficient to provide a helpful anchor as you search for an equally attractive cash gift. No such anchor is available for question B, which is therefore much harder to answer. Respondents also assess the cash gift equivalent of gambles with a 21% chance to win the two outcomes. As expected, the difference between the high probability and low probability gambles was much more pronounced for the money than for the roses. To bolster their argument that insensitivity to probability is not caused by emotion, the Princeton team compared willingness to pay avoid gambles. 21% chance or 84% chance to spend a weekend painting someone's three-bedroom apartment. 21% chance or 84% chance to clean three stores in a dormitory bathroom after a weekend of use. The second outcome is surely much more emotional than the first, but the decision weight for the two outcomes did not differ. Evidently, the intensity of emotion is not the answer. Evidently, the intensity of the emotion is not the answer. Another experiment yielded a surprising result. The participants received explicit price information along with the verbal description of price. An example could be 84% chance, chance to win a dozen red roses in a glass face value $59, 21% chance to win a dozen, rose, a dozen red roses in a glass phase value $59. It is easy to assess the expected monetary value of these gambles, but adding a specific monetary value did not alter the results. Evaluations remained insensitive to probability even in that condition. People who thought of the gift as a chance to get roses did not use the price information as an anchor in evaluating the gamble. As scientists sometimes say, this is a surprising finding that it's trying to tell us something. What story is trying to tell us? The story, I believe, is that the rich and vivid representation of the outcome, whether or not it is emotional, reduces the role of probability in the evaluation of an uncertain prospect. The hypothesis suggests a prediction in which I have reasonably high confidence adding relevant but vivid detail to a monetary outcome also disrupts calculation. Compare your cash equivalents for the following outcomes. 21% or 84% chance to receive $59 next Monday. 21% chance or 84% chance to receive a large blue cardboard envelope containing $59 next Monday morning. The new hypothesis is that there will be a less sensitivity to, be, uh, to probability in the second case. Because the blue envelope evokes a richer and more fluent representation than the abstract notion of a sum money, you constructed the event in your mind, and the vivid image of 
and the vivid image of the outcome exists. There, even if you know that its probability is low, cognitive ease contributes to the certainty effect as well. When you hold a vivid image of an event, that possibility of its not occurring is also represented vividly and overweighted. The combination of an enhanced possibility effect with an enhanced certainty effect leaves lower room for decision ways to change between chances of 21 and 84 percent. Vivid probability, the idea that fluency, vividness, and the ease of imaging contribute to decision weights gain support from many other observations. Participants in well-known experiments are given a choice of drawing a marble from one of two urns in which red marbles win a prize. Urn A contains 10 marbles, of which one is red. Urn B contains 100 marbles, of which eight are red. Which urn would you choose? The chances of winning are 10% in urn A and 8% in urn B. The right choice should be easy, but it's not. About 34, 30 to 40% of students choose the urn with the larger number of winning marbles rather than the urn that provides a better chance of winning. Seymour Epstein has urged that, sorry, not has urged, has argued the results illustrate the superficial processing characteristics of system one, which he calls the experiment, experiential, experiential system. As you might expect, the remarkably foolish choices that people make in this situation have attracted the attention of many researchers. Second, jeez, look at that. How you doing? My name's... How you doing, huh? Yeah, that's good. Okay, great. Oh, God. Close your door, bro. Okay, uh, so as you might expect, the remarkably foolish choices that people make in this situation have attracted the attention of many researchers. The bias has been given several names, following Paul Slovich, I will call it denominator neglect. If your attention is drawn to the winning marbles, you do not assess the number of non-winning marbles with the same care. Vivid imagery contributes to denominator neglect, at least as I experience it. Uh, when I think of the small urn, I see a single red marble on a vaguely defined background of the white marbles. When I think of the large urn, larger urn, I see eight winning red marbles on an dis indistinct background of white marbles. Which... Uh, da -da -da, I lost my place. Which creates a more hopeful feeling. The distinctive vividness of winning marbles increases the decision weight of the event enhancing the possibility effect. Of course, the same will be true of the certainty effect. If I have 90% chance of winning a prize, the event of not winning will be more salient if 10 of 100 marbles are losers than if one out of 10 marbles yield the same outcome. So obviously he's trying to say that we, because we automatically go for the larger pie, we want the larger pie and our mind is so vivid when we see the first two numbers that we kind of gravitate towards the larger number and the, because our image of it is so vivid that we want to go for the bigger because we want to be as as we say constantly in the book the survivability rate increases if you go for the bigger pie obviously which makes sense more energy more sustaining blah 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 you get the point the idea of denominator neglect helps explain why different ways of communicating risks vary so much in the, in the effects. You read that a vaccine that protects children from a fatal disease carries a 0.01 risk of a permanent disability. The risk appears small. Now consider another description of the same risk. One of 100,000 vaccinated children will be permanently disabled. The second statement does nothing to your mind that the first does not. It calls up the image of an individual child who is who is permanently disabled by a vaccine. The 9,999, sorry, the 90, 99,999 safely vaccinated children have faded into the background. As predicted by denominator neglect, low probability events are much more heavily weighted when described in terms of relative frequencies than when stated in more abstract terms of chance, risk, or probability. How likely, as we have seen system one, is much better at dealing with the individuals than categories. So it's an interesting fact that he's trying to say is that most, when you read an article or statistic, 
the way they word this, this statistic, it, it, it kind of like gives you an idea of certain, uh, like it gives you, a, I keep, it can give you a different impression of what is actually going on. So they could say the same thing, but differently, and it gives you a different feeling or a different idea of what is going on. And I think that there's also an interesting fact about us that's yeah, pretty, makes sense. The effect of frequency format is large. In one study, people who saw information about a disease that kills 1,286 people out of every 10,000 judged it as more dangerous than people who were told about a disease that kills 24.14% of the population. The first disease appears more threatening than the second, although the former risk is only half as large as the latter. An even more direct demonstration of denominator neglect, a disease that kills 1,286 people out of every 10,000 was judged more dangerous than a disease that killed 24.4 out of 100. The effect would surely be reduced or eliminated if participants were asked for a direct comparison of the two formulations, a task that explicitly calls for system two. Life, however, is usually between subjects, experiments in which you see only in one formulation at a time. So that's kind of hilarious. I mean, not about the disease and everything, but it's hilarious because that's how you say, okay, there's 24,000 people dead, right? So if you put that, every we change the perspective on things or an emotional vividness to our, you know, how we see things. You, if you, just let me repeat that. Uh, we change the idea or the view on how we view this specific uh, situation or scenario. A small number could change it or the way you say that number or a percentage or something <clears throat> can affect the vividness and the uh, the idea of what is going on okay it would take an exceptionally active system too to generate alternative formulations of the one you see and to discover they that they evoke a different response experience they, they said that experienced forensic psychologists and psychiatrists are not immune to the effect of that format in which risks are expressed in one experiment, professionals evaluated whether it was safe to discharge from the psychiatric hospital at a sorry from the psychiatric hospital a patient, Mr. Jones, with a history of violence. The information they received included an expert's assessment of risk. The same statistic were described in two ways. Patients similar to Mr. Jones are estimated to have a 10% probability of committing an act of violence against others during the first several months after discharge. Of every 100 patients similar to Mr. Jones, tens are estimated to commit an act of violence against others during the, uh, the first several months after discharge. The professionals who saw the frequency format were almost twice as likely to deny discharge, 41% compared to 21% in the probability format. The more vivid description produces a higher decision weight for the same probability. The power format creates opportunities for manipulations with people with an axe to grind know how to exploit. Slovich and his colleagues cite in an article that states the approximately 1,000 homicides a year are committed nationwide by seriously mentally ill individuals who are not taking their medication. Another way of expressing the same fact is that 1,000 of 273 million Americans will die in the manner each year. And other is that the annual likely of be, the likelihood of being killed by such an individual is approximately 0.00036%. Still another 1,000 Americans will die in this manner each year or less than one thirteenth the number who will die of suicide and about one fourth the number who will die of laryngeal cancer i think i don't know i think it's laryngeal cancer slovic points out that, that these advocates are quite open about their motivation they want to frighten the general public about violence by people with mental disorder in the hope that this fuel will translate into increased funding for mental health services a good attorney who wishes to cast doubt on DNA evidence will not tell the jury that the chance of false match is 0.1%. The statement that a false match occurs in one of a 1,000 capital cases is far more likely to pass threshold of a reasonable doubt. So yeah, I mean, that does make sense in the fact that people have specific biases, therefore they are write it or uh, present it in a specific way to get their way. And therefore, I mean, obviously that makes sense to get funding. I mean, that's a that's a complete example of a political party or a or a uh, actor or anybody who says something to get their way is that's what they would do. The jurors hearing those words are invited to generate the image of the man who sits before them in the courtroom being wrongly convicted because of flawed DNA evidence. The prosecutor, of course, will favor the more abstract frame, hoping to fill the jurors' minds with decimal points. 
decisions from a global but that's actually a good point do jurors actually kind of see their perspective so like lawyers say it's not what you it's not what's true it's what you can prove in court and therefore this is exactly the whole idea of why our judicial judicial systems are maybe easy and can be easily manipulated depending on how accurate the evidence is then you're obviously going to have an accurate you know uh accurate uh, judgment on the person but the, it's very i mean the amount of people that decide what is going on i don't know that it's a great question to ask ourselves this i it's a very interesting it's a definitely hard idea on the mind because that means maybe some of them like there is people who are wrongly you know crucified uh, uh crucified for maybe not even and oh my, oh my, sorry i'm getting distracted they might you know these people are being crucified for maybe not doing the crime they actually did i mean we don't know generally speaking what is the actual uh what's going on but uh you oh god uh, sorry uh uh, uh it's getting distracted sorry uh this, so anyway moving on to this idea it's a sad thing okay The evidence suggests the hypothesis that focal tension and salience contribute to both the overestimation of unlikely events and the overweighting of unlikely outcomes. Salience is enhanced by mere mention of an event by its vividness and by the format in which probability is described. There are exceptions, of course, in which focusing on an event does not raise its probability. Cases in which an erroneous theory makes an event appear impossible, even when you think about it, or cases in which an inability to imagine how an outcome might come about leaves you're convinced that it will not happen the bias toward an overestimation and overweighting of salient events is not an absolute rule but it is large and robust there has been much interest in recent years in studies of choice from experience which follow different rules from the choices from description that are analyzed in prospect theory participants in a typical experiment face two buttons when pressed each button produces either a monetary reward or nothing and the outcome is drawn randomly according to the specifications of a prospect for example five percent to win twelve dollars or 95 percent chance to win one dollar the process is truly random so there is no guarantee that the sample a participant sees exactly represents the statistical setup the expected values associated with the two buttons are approximately equal but one is riskier and more variable than the other for example, one button may produce $10 on 5% of the trials and the other $1 on 50% of the trials. Choice from experience is implemented by exposing the participant to many trials in which she can observe the consequences of pressing one but one button or, or another. Sorry. Um, anyway, the choice from experience is implemented by exposing the participants to many trials in which she can observe the consequences of pressing one button to, to uh, one button or another. On the critical child, she chooses one of the two buttons and she earns the outcome on that trial. Choice from description is realized by showing the subject the verbal description of the risky prospect associated with each button, such as 5% to win $12, and asking her to choose one. As expected from prospect theory, choice from description yields a possibility effect where outcomes are overweighted relative to their probability. In sharp contrast, overweighting is never observed in choice from experience and underweighting is common. <sighs> can do this, man. We're nearly there. Okay. Uh, the experimental situation of choice by experience is intended to represent many situations in which we are exposed to variable outcomes from the same source. A restaurant that is <clears throat> usually good may occasionally serve brilliant or an un or sorry. Oh my God, a restaurant that is usually good may occasionally serve a brilliant or an awful meal. Your friend is usually good company, but he sometimes turns moody and aggressive. California is prone to earthquakes, but they happen rarely. The results of many experiments suggest that rare events are not overweighted when we make decisions such as choosing a restaurant or tying down the boiler to reduce earthquake damage. The interpretation of choice from experience is not yet settled, but there is general agreement on one major cause of underweighting of rare events. 
Both in experience and in the real world, many participants never experienced the rare event. Most Californians have never experienced a major earthquake. And in 2007, no banker had personally experienced a devastating financial crisis. Ralph Pertwick and Ida Rev noted Note that chances of rare events such as the burst of housing bubbles receive less impact than they deserve according to their objective probabilities. They point to the public's tepid response to long-term environmental threats as an example. These examples of neglect are both important and easily explained by but underweighting also occurs when people have actually experienced the rare event. Suppose you have a complicated question that two colleagues on your floor could probably answer. You have known the, them both for years and have had many occasions to observe and experience their character. Adele is fairly consistent and generally helpful, though not exceptional on that dimension. Brian is not quite as friendly and helpful as Adele most of the time, but on some occasions he has been extremely generous with his time and advice. Whom will you approach? Consider two possible views of decision. It is choice between two gambles. Adele's are closer to a sure thing. The prospect of Brian is more likely to a yield to a yield more likely to a yield a slightly inferior outcome with low probability or a very good one. The rare event will be overweighted by a possibility effect favoring Brian. It is a choice between your global impressions of Adele and Brian. The good and the bad experiences you have had are pulled in your representation of their normal behavior. Unless the rare event is so extreme that it comes to mind separately. Brian once verbally abused a colleague who asked for his help. The norm will be biased toward typical and recent instances favoring Adele. In the two system mind, the second interpretation appears far more plausible. System one generates global representations of Adele and Brian, which include an emotional attitude and a tendency to approach or avoid. Nothing beyond a comparison of these tendencies is needed to determine the door on which you will knock. Unless the rare event comes to your mind explicitly, it will not be overweighted. Applying the same idea to the experiment on choice from experience is straightforward. As they observe generating outcomes over time, the two buttons develop integrated personalities to which emotional responses are attached. The conditions under which rare events are ignored or overweighted are better understood now than they were when prospect theory was formulated. The probability of rare event will often not always be overestimated because of the com confirmatory bias of memory. The probability of a rare event will often not always be overestimated because will often be over not always but overestimated because of the confirmatory bias of memory. Thinking about that event you try to make it true in your mind. A rare event will be overweighted if it specifically attracts attention. Separate attention is effectively guaranteed when prospects are described explicitly 99% chance to win $1,000 and 1% 1 chance to win nothing. Obsessive concerns the bus in Jerusalem, vivid images, the roses, concrete representation, one over 1,000, and explicit reminders as in choice from description all contribute to overweighting. And when there is no overweighting, there will be neglect. There will be neglect. When it comes to rare probabilities, our mind is not designed to get things quite right. For the residents of planet, they may be exposed to events no one has yet experienced. This is not good news. Shit. Speaking of rare events, tsunamis are very rare even in Japan, but the image is so vivid and compelling the tourists are bound to overestimate their probability. As this familiar disaster cycle begin in exaggeration and overweighting, then neglect sets in. We shouldn't focus on single scenarios or, or we will overestimate its probabilities to set up specific alternatives and make the probabilities add up to 100%. They want, people to, they want people to be worried by the risk. That's why they describe it as one death per thousand. They're counting on denominator neglect. Okay. A lot has been learned here in this chapter. So we understand that the denominator effect we get we, more numbers equals more vivid imagery obviously more violent images create a, 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 a determinant to stay away from risk so what the, i mean it does make sense so any type of threat or any type of idea of size the matter creates either risk or opportunity or <clears throat> or a yeah exactly that's my whole point uh, that, that's, that was an interesting chapter. Okay, guys, that's pretty much it for that chapter. Very interesting chapter about how we uh, view events and how we view specific things in our lives. Um, and that's it. All right, you know what to do. Comment, subscribe, like, blah, blah, blah. You know the deal. Hope you enjoyed the video and see you in the next one. Cheers.